What's up, guys? We are here with Flame. Now, do you just yes. do, you, do you just go with Flame, or do you like? Are you like? Is that is, your, is it your? You pop out of the womb, and your mom was like Flame, <laughs> like. <laughs> right. But I actually was Flame before I became a Christian. So just even as a kid, I was known as Flame. And then when I became a teenager, I was known as Flame because I used to always have marijuana. I used to always have weed. So people was like, that's the dude with the fire. And uh, when I became a Christian, I just changed the definition. So I didn't do like the whole Saul Paul thing. I just, I kept the name, you know what I mean? And just converted the, <laughs> the meaning behind it, so to speak. That's right. you, yeah. so that, 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 you, you figured out, you're like, oh, these Christians are about redemption. I think I could just redeem this name. Yeah, I could yeah. just redeem this name. They'll get it. They'll get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, exactly. so, I so, it. I mean, so I've known about you for, for a while, man. I mean, like the, I mean, I'm not, uh, huge into the the christian hip-hop scene but uh but i've been involved in music my whole life and and you know it was you know what, what 10 years ago or so christian hip-hop kind of had like had a big moment you know like, yeah. like a, with reach records and all this stuff and there was all these uh all these dudes that were coming out um you know, they were all of a sudden you had like hip-hop artists at like big major christian conferences and stuff you know <laughs> um, true, and, true. yeah and that, that was some of my introduction to you like and you were kind of maybe I don't know if you were in I don't know if you say you're in that group you were at least associated with it enough that like I knew who you were right uh, came on your radar yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah um and and maybe and that so that's that's sort of who you are right like if you're this, this you're a hip-hop artist rapper that was that was coming up with those same group kind of in that same time period as some of those other guys like Lecrae and uh, Trip Lee. yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's I mean so it's, it was a group called Cross Movement with really they're like the James Brown they're like the godfather to anyone that's doing christian rap now we mm -hmm. all were uh, either influenced by them or actually signed to their record label so we kind of salute and tip our hats to cross movement for being the guys who really kind of laid the blueprint for this entire thing and um at one point i was on cross movement records lecrae artist named the truth mm -hmm. uh, jr and then eventually we all broke off and started our own companies but because we were friends we would work together so closely and uh, we were so like-minded, we just exported the same kind of content just throughout the states, all over the world. So yeah, you're right. Like we came up together, branched off mm -hmm. around the same time period and just kept hitting it hard. Yeah. And then it started to get that widespread acceptance, conferences, festivals, things like that really helped us take off. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yep. yeah one thing that's interesting about, about hip hop is that, uh, is how much collaboration there is. I mean, like, it, yeah. like, like, you know, I mean, so, the, the world I was in, like the music world I was in, they, like a band releases a record, but there's not like all these other bands having guest spots on their record or whatever. Like this is your <laughs> record, man. Like I ain't, yeah. think I ain't working with some other band, even if I'm friends True. with them, right? So like hip hop's yeah. unique in that way where, you know, like so you guys would release out, you know, EPs or whatever, and like yeah. half the songs would be featuring you know, some <laughs> other cat, you know? Right, half yeah. the project has got features on it, you know? Yeah, yeah. But you're right, that kind of validates you in the, in the rap market is it's someone sort mm -hmm. of like laying hands on you saying, I vouch for this dude. Like mm -hmm. he's quality, yeah. good art, high standard of presentation. And when their followers see you associated with them, they tend to give you at least the time of day to hear you out. And that's up to you from that point. But you're right, sure. that's like a, 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 a unique marker of the rap genre is features and linking up with each other to help catapult the entire movement yeah yeah flame so, i want to i mean i'm curious i mean i want to i want to spend some more time on on the music and and on your career uh because yeah. i know i mean this is your 10th album you come out with yeah 10th yeah, record well, yeah, yeah it's actually it's a short project an ep mm -hmm. um so it's not a full length but right so at this point i have nine full bodies of work and this okay. would just be I just wanted to just kind of throw that out there as an update, sort of. <laughs> you threw that out there as like, kind of like a bomb. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know it. Can, I know it was like that, but yeah, yep, yeah. Yep. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think it would be good to to just hear a little bit about your background, like sort of where where you were raised, you know, where you came from. Uh, yeah. If you wouldn't mind, just share a little bit about uh, about your history. Yeah, how, yeah, yeah and, and how you came to faith and like the and even not not I mean obviously people are like why are you what like what is this interview about and obviously this new EP <laughs> is is really yeah. about a transition into into Lutheran theology, uh, right. but yeah man but like hey dude like I wasn't raised in Lutheran church so I'm still cool with the testimony like the initial one like how a dude became a believer at all like I'm still <laughs> right, right, I, I, cool. I, like I'm still I'm still good with that sort of stuff so yeah. Uh, so yeah so like how, how did you how did you be, get into the were you born into a Christian home or like did 
what, how did that happen? And then what were the theological transitions over time leading up to that? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, in the inner city, the hood, whatever you want to call it. And I was always influenced by Christianity. It was just kind of the cultural norm as well as my family culture. But I wouldn't say I necessarily grew up in a church. Uh, but for me, my grandmother was the strongest pillar in my family that stood for Christ. She was the one that made faith attractive. She just influenced me to read my Bible and consider, you know, at least Christ in my conscience as I'm making decisions in life. So that, that did inform how I would move at school or just out in the streets, just kind of like this God conscious, this awareness. And, um, but at the same time, hip hop culture, gang culture, the drug culture, those things were influential as well. So I always thought, man, do a little bit of yourself, a little bit for God, happy life. And uh, so I tried that, you know, I tried a little bit of, you know what I'm saying, drugs and clubbing. I was super young, hanging out with older dudes. All of my friends, while I was like, 13, 14, 15, these dudes were 21, 22. So I was leaving the state of Missouri, going to Atlanta and all kind of crazy clubs as a young kid. So I grew up pretty quickly in that way. And um, eventually I got into a lot of trouble in my high school. Some dudes ran into our school with guns looking for me and a couple of my friends. And uh, the security guard came to my classroom and he was like, yo, Flame, there's some dudes in the school looking for you. Like, I'm gonna let you leave out the back. So I did, I left, right? The security wow. guard comes to your classroom, says, you're in danger, leave, what do you do? You leave. <laughs> so that's what I did. And uh, eventually I got kicked out of school for that. And uh, had to transfer, go to a new school. Long story short, on the way home from the orientation at this new school, I was in a tragic accident. I was hit three times by an 18 wheeler carrying fuel, spinning down a highway about 65, 70 miles per hour in a 360. There was a 12 car pile up. We hit the left shoulder of the highway. The car flipped over, wrecked the entire left side of my body. I had to do physical therapy for over a year just to recover. And I remember going back to my grandmother asking her, why did God let this happen? I said the magic words in Jesus' name, and I still got into this collision, still got mm -hmm. injured. And she was like, I don't know why. I don't know why God let it happen, but maybe he's trying to get your attention. And about a week or so after that discussion, she died from her fifth heart attack. And uh, for me, it was those two events back to back that got me to asking the big questions. Why am I here? What's the point of this life? Is heaven real? And uh, I met this girl and uh, she invited me to church. And I was like, eh, I'm cool mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, you know I mean, I was kind of mad at God, to be honest. And uh, one of my homies, his dad had just got life in prison. So we spent every night over his house just wilding out, doing crazy stuff. And this girl gave my number to some of the dudes at the church. So they started calling me like, hey, bro. We heard about your situation. We just want to love on you, man, and say you want to play basketball, come play video games, come chill with us. And I kept blowing them off. But eventually I was like, man, I can't front. These dudes kind of cool, you know? And uh, I went and I heard the gospel. And I was like, man, I, I need this hope. I need this help. And the Lord saved me at 16. And I just mm. started writing music from that point about my experience. And here I am. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Not long and short. <laughs> yeah. That's a great, yeah, that's man. a great story, man. Thank you. So, yeah, so you was, was that, was that a, was it a, a reform group of guys? Is that how you first started get, getting into reform theology? So, because obviously, obviously like what, what was also really strange about, uh, <laughs> about like that, that rap scene blowing up was that it was, it's, yeah. it was broadly reformed, right? Yes. Yes. So at that point it was not. So I came up in the word of faith, charismatic church, uh, in particular the full gospel, which is like a blend between, Baptists and Pentecostals. Uh, yeah, yeah. Head, it's I'm a aware. guy named. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a guy I've been named there, Paul. man. You've been there, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So it's a dude named Paul S. Morton who was like the presiding bishop. That's what they call him, and he kind of started the denomination, I guess. And that's what he, the way he explains it. And uh, so that was kind of where I found my roots in the faith, and I got a lot of good and helpful things there. But the dudes that reached out to me, they were just, I'll just regular, you know what I mean, Christian dudes uh, mm -hmm. trying to live out their faith in the hood. And the reform thought came five years after that experience where I ended up going on tour with the group cross movement. And a couple mm -hmm. of the members in the group had either gone to like, um, uh, Dallas theological seminary or Philadelphia, mm -hmm. Philadelphia Bible college. And they kind of start throwing terms around like Calvin, 
Jacob Arminius, and I'm like, I've never heard of neither one of them dudes, and they have no bearing <laughs> on my life, and I really don't care. I just love Jesus. And uh, so through the course of that two months, just kind of walking me through some of that church history stuff, I thought it was like the Bible days, Billy Graham, and then us. I didn't think it was anything in between. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they like, yeah. nah, it's a bunch of stuff that happened in between. I'm like, okay, break it down. So that was my first exposure to this whole world of, you know, church history and things like that. So that's when the, the reform thought started to really grip me as they took more a bit more to the intellectual side of things. And that was that was attractive, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I took to it and you're right, it translated into my music and I started to really uh export Calvinistic exegesis reform doctrine in my music. And uh yeah, that defines my music for pretty much 18 years. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 That that'll it's interesting how uh I I know for me, man, like th th that moment that you realize that, that church history didn't start like you know, <laughs> like like at the like the great awakening isn't when Jesus walked the earth or whatever, you know. Uh yeah. it's weird and it's weird and you feel like a fool kind of at least I did, where I'm like, wait, like why didn't I ever think about that, that this thing's been going on for 2000 years and like, maybe I should be investigating some of this stuff. Right. Like, yeah, and all of a sudden yeah. someone starts making arguments from church history. And if you don't know anything, man, you're going to lose. Yeah. Exactly. You don't got any weapons to, to <laughs> go back against that, man. Right. right. You just like, say, just give me Jesus. You default to Jesus. <laughs> all else yeah. fails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah, yeah. And yeah. So they start bringing up questions like, you know, you start saying, uh, this is happening with me too, you know, and, and you, you'll, you'll say, I just need the Bible. And they're like, man, where'd that Bible come from? You know, and that kind of stuff. And, you, and you, <laughs> any way, any way you try to like bob and weave, man, you're just getting hit, you know, and you start, exactly. at the end of the day, you realize like, man, I'm just kind of acting a fool. Right. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I got no arguments for any of this. Exactly. And, um, yeah. And then, you know, I mean, with, uh, with reformed theology, I mean, uh, it's a, it is, it is, a is very appealing if you're starting to think about things intellectually, because, um, one thing that the one thing that the reformed uh, theologians did uh, and Calvin did too is everything makes sense. Yes, you know, like like everything fits. Like I mean, so you're like, okay, I, I, I you, and you feel like, all right, I got something I can like really understand. Yeah, uh, but yeah. it also feels theo uh, uh, intellectually rigorous too. So so yeah. it appeals to that sort of part of you too. Like if you're like really want to think and and yeah. dig into stuff, but you also are very analytical and want everything to make sense, works. Oh man, exactly. that was that was like the most appealing thing to me. I all so just a little history about me, uh, Flame. I mean, I was this close. I mean, I was sort of on the fence be, when I was choosing seminaries between going to Westminster or going to the seminary I ended up going to, which was my own denomination's uh, Lutheran seminary. But gotcha. uh, because I and, and the reason why is because I was so drawn to the logical consistency of it all. I mean, it, it really appealed to me. I ended up choosing to go to the other seminary because I, I I got some good counsel to you know kind of investigate my view of the sacraments and determine where I was at with that, which yeah. for me and I don't know if they, this was <laughs> this is part of your transition we can talk about that uh, <laughs> the sacraments man was the hardest thing for me to to grasp it took a <laughs> while I was I went kicking and screaming man <laughs> no I totally relate bro I think um, and in my particular brand of reform thought, which is the reform Baptist, it was, it is it, that much more difficult because the perspective of the sacraments is strictly symbolic. So yeah. we don't even have categories for a middle grounds where some people do, you know? And so you're right. It was, it was something that you, you go kicking and screaming because you can't let go. And, uh, but that's something that I'm, I'm even sensitive to now as I continue to think through it and talk about it. I understand I'm, I'm really just fresh off of wrapping my mind around it in a way that allows me to humble myself and go where the scripture leads. So even when I talk to non-Lutheran thinkers, I'm sensitive to remember and understand how difficult that is, if you, especially if you're coming from the Reformed Baptist side of things. So you're right, yeah. bro. Yeah, sure. you don't get yeah. and you don't get anywhere uh, just going around like I mean you you probably remember that you know yeah they had this uh when, back when the rest young restless reform thing was like like really booming they had yeah. this uh, you really had this phrase like cage stage Calvinist and it was like when somebody became a Calvinist <laughs> and you like lock them up and like not let them yeah. talk to anyone right because yeah yeah, yeah and uh and you, I mean and Lutherans just have they have they don't have nearly as many uh, 
sort of adult converts to that to that way of thinking so uh-huh. so there was no there's no cage stage lutheran phrase but i yeah. have seen i have seen it evident before where due to like and i think this i think this happens and it is, or there's a potential for it to happen when anyone changes theologies where you're like yeah. okay all right dude i got the truth and now i just you just go and put everyone on blast right right i did it i mean i think i think part of it is it's that it's that zeal and that excitement yeah and uh because when I first became a Christian, bro, like I was, I was zealous. Like I was a freshman in high school. Um, I started running back my freshman year. So I was pretty popular and well-known. Mm-hmm. And then when I became a Christian, I, I had that same go-getter energy. I remember in high school, one of my teachers was giving a lecture. I literally, I stood up on my desk. And I was like, nothing the teacher's saying right now is important. I was like, the most important thing is when you die, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? <laughs> and my teacher literally was like, just standing like there like, what the heck is this kid talking about? <laughs> and he sent, he sent me to the principal's office. Now my principal just happened to have been a Christian. So he was like, flame, I get it. You're excited about your faith, man, but you cannot take this approach. Like school is not <laughs> offensive to God. But I understand that energy where you, you, you got something new, it helped you in, in so many ways and you just want to tell the world, you know, but it's, it's a way to, to deliver it. But Calvinism, I think you're right. It does, it, it, it breathes that excitement because it's these newfound understandings of God's sovereignty and the supremacy of the scriptures. And then you start to kind of- Doctrines look of at grace. Your, yeah, doctrines yeah. of grace. You start to look at your past in a way that makes you, a bit of an alarmist. Not, not, not everybody's like that, but there's a sense in which a lot of people become a bit of an alarmist and you just want to warn or help, whichever way you want to t- phrase it, and tell people about it. So yeah. it's something you write. It, it is like a, a phase that it's approaching. He's learning the doctrines of grace. Like, Lord, give him the temperament to kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I get Yeah, it. well, you get, you get this, you end up having the, uh, this feeling that you're like, okay, good. Like, I'm also historically rooted now. Right, because yes. I mean, because even with the reform, you're like, well, at least I'm going back, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and so you're you're, you're taught, and I, I, this is something that, and I, I like, dude, I got loads and loads of like reformed uh, bros, and like we work with reformed people, and like a yeah. bunch of uh, reformed guys. That I just I love, I love and, that. yeah, tons of friends. But um, one thing I think is always funny is that the, the, the they'll talk about the Reformation, like they'll be like theology of the Reformation, as if there was like no. Like, I'm like, yeah, but like, you didn't go like the, the, the language sometimes I'm like, y'all, sometimes y'all sound like you were the ones nailing that thing to that door, man. Like sometimes <laughs> I like, sometimes like, I feel like maybe people get the impression that like Calvin, like rolled up on like the castle church in Wittenberg and started hammering, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, now you're right. I, like, well, the way it happened for me was when I was first exposed to reformation thought, like there was this, there was a quick visit of Luther's part of the story and then you yes. kind of he kind of kindled it, it off but he didn't exactly. go didn't go as far as as he as he should in some areas and mm-hmm. and so that's where the other guys came and picked it up exactly you get the yeah. bondage of the will and then you're off you know what i mean so, yeah 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 for sure man so, so for me it was more so like i thought i was in step with luther i thought you know john calvin luther same thing same person like i really sure. didn't have someone that kind of slowed me down and say wait, there's some differences here, you know? And I think um, in particular, the bondage of the will, a lot of people feel like he spoke so much like a Calvinist. So me having studied at a Calvinistic Institute, uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Was um, that in, uh, which one were you uh, you at? In in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, in Louisville, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mm -hmm. having studied at Boyce College, the undergrad, and I started at the seminary, um, that was my experience. It was always praising Luther, always speaking well of him but I didn't necessarily get exposed to some of the distinctions. And um, so you don't get a fuller picture of what really took place during a Reformation time. And I don't know why, I guess I'm assuming it just has something to do with obviously uh, being Calvinistic, you know, at least the professors that are, the agenda is to keep you moving in that direction versus bring, you know, so I can respect that. But to, to your point of, you know, still, meshing well with Presbyterians and other persons who believe and follow after Calvin. I love that, man. I think yeah. that's beautiful that we can oh, walk well, together still, as brothers. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
Well, there's still loads, loads of stuff to agree on. I mean, like you want to say yeah. amen to the things that you can say amen to, and uh, right. and then and then and then you know, hopefully, the things that you disagree about, dude. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with with dudes. I mean, like as as genuine brothers, and just yeah. dude, just hashed it out, you know, yeah. and then you know, and then hugged it out afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> like, because it's all it's all good. Because I mean, I think um, Rod Rosenblatt says like in in like in many ways like lutherans have like no closer cousins than the reformed i mean like if you're gonna talk about like like who's closest you're like yeah yeah that's <laughs> that's it's, yeah. it's the next closest thing right uh which yeah. is which is why a lot of people that and there's not as many people that do it uh, a lot of people stop with with the reform they'll they'll come out of like basic big box evangelicalism and become reformed and kind of the transition stops because lutherans are terrible at evangelism but the um, <laughs> Yo, man, you gotta talk, you gotta talk, you gotta you gotta air out your dirty laundry too, man. You can't like act like it's all like it's all shine up there. It's not the uh, but but yeah, like so it's there's a there is a thing where uh, the, the few people that do end up going from you know a reformed theology and they like they like start looking more and then they end up Lutheran. Um, yeah, that's a that's a pretty natural transition. Almost everyone that becomes a Lutheran who wasn't born one makes a like makes a pit stop. You yeah. know, in, in Reformed theology. I, I don't know hardly anybody who went like from, you know, non-denominational, like right into Lutheranism. Like they, oh, like, right. Yeah. So like, I, I thank the Presbyterians for being that gateway drug. Yeah. Like, because I like, I need, I need, I need them to ease that transition up. Yeah, I'm sure they'd like that, Dan. I'm sure yeah. they'd appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, you, you, like I told my pastor now, I said, man, Calvin brought me to Luther. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was just my experience. And, yeah. um, but my, it's so interesting too, because for me, like even my Lutheran experience now is unique in that I came to uh, Lutheran thought through the academic world, through the institution. So yeah. I, don't have a, I don't have a great reference point for Lutheran culture, right? right? So, so yeah. in many ways, my presentation was probably the highest because I had a bunch of men who were thinking clearly about it, a bunch of students that were giving me their experience so mine was mine is probably a bit more um i guess it it's it's still in development in terms of mm -hmm. of some of the things you guys are mentioning. I haven't been able to feel all of those angst, you know yeah. because yeah. i haven't I haven't even been in a Lutheran church a whole you know I don't even know how i I guess we finally locked in and settled in probably like a year ago, so for me, yeah. it's like I'm still learning it's still new, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's still new. So in that way, I don't have some of the those uh, the, like the perspective that some of the students would that grew up in it, mm -hmm. and they see all the ebb and flow and and, and things of that sort. So yeah, but I, I definitely I am enjoying learning um, what goes on in a Lutheran culture as well as being able to contribute some of the good things that I've gained in my experience, and as well as use my platform to bring awareness to these sweet doctrines, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And to be out on a, an evangelistic level with non-Christians like, yo, I think if, if I can break down God's love for you as it was, you know, articulated from Luther and others, taking you back to Paul and the scripture, like, I would love to see people come to the faith yeah. and be able to bypass other things and just move straight from non-Christian to these sweet doctrines. Like, yeah. that would be yeah. amazing oh. to see. Oh, dude, you know dude. I mean? I, well, yeah, dude, the best thing to do, the best thing is when you're actually able, when, you know, when some, some non-believers got some objection, they say like, I, I, I just could never believe in a God that fill in the blank. And it's great. Cause half the time you're like, yo, I don't believe in that God either. Mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. like they're, they're saying, they're, they're saying something that they heard and you're like, well, yeah. I don't believe that. That's not the God I believe in, you know? So <laughs> right. like, we're on, we on the same page. Let me introduce you to something else, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, and that's I, I mean, I came in the same way. I, as you did, I, it was, I was all through reading scholars and, and studying church history and stuff. And so I didn't, I wasn't mixing it up with a lot of Lutherans. I didn't know anything about Lutheran culture and it's a good mm -hmm. thing. Um, mm -hmm. because, uh, the theology, I mean, cause I, I mean, when I decided, I'm like, Oh man, the, surely this culture is perfect. And you find, and you kind of finding out that none of the cultures are perfect. You're like, Oh man, this culture has got problems just like every other one, you know? Yeah, and, um, uh, yeah, but but the theology, like I was so convinced, um, you know, like man, I think that this is just, and I think that you know, you can tell me if this is true for you. For me, yeah. one of the things that actually it was difficult at first, but now is something that I really love 
uh, about Lutheran theology is the ability to be comfortable with paradox and holding things in tension and, and not, not actually having everything figured out, but, but an actual view of Sola Scriptura that says, look, if the Bible speaks two ways about a, about a thing, uh, or even, even if it seems to be contradictory to each other, where these two things can't work together, uh, as opposed to like jam a, a square peg in a round hole, we're just going to say amen and amen and, and, yeah. and hold them in tension. Uh, yeah. at, at, at first that was really difficult. Cause I'm like, wait a minute. Like, like what, what, what do you, what do you mean that, what do you mean that God wants everyone to be saved, but then like everyone's not saved? What, yeah. like how, like what, why, what is that? Like, is God, why, you tell me God doesn't get what he ultimately wants. Like, why doesn't he just make it happen? Yeah. And the fact, the fact that Lutherans are willing to say like, yeah, we don't have an answer for that. <laughs> not really. Like they just say, look, God saves some. And if, and if you, and if he saves you, it's all his doing. Yeah. Uh, but he would desire that all be saved, but some people reject him. And if that's the case, that's your doing. And those things don't like, you know, completely, you're not like, Oh, sweet. Like that, that makes complete rational sense to, to my fall in reason. Um, uh-huh. like that's difficult at first, but now I realize that there's so much of that in the Bible, um, where God, where God is just not, I mean, his ways, are just, you start to realize like his ways really aren't our ways. And like, <laughs> like and he's really. serious when he says that, like, like I'm serious. Yeah. My ways are going to be, not not the way you would do it um and and that he's that hasn't and the, the comfort level that you have that he has not revealed everything he's just revealed what he knows is necessary for us to know right yeah um, no, I, I, yeah i totally agree bro yeah so that was like, it's yeah i'm sorry i cut you off no bro. no i was gonna, i was just asking that if you if that was a struggle too where you're like wait a minute some of these blocks like are like some of this stuff doesn't fit but what it does do is it accounts for all the it lets the verses stand right it lets the scripture speak and if right. and we're not going to jam it into some system yeah yeah absolutely and that's and that's interesting too because you know one of the hermeneutical principles that's repeated in the calvinistic circle for me and i'm sure anybody that's taking hermeneutic seriously uh the art and science of studying the scriptures is um you're looking for the plain reading of the text, the plain meaning of the text, and you interpret, um, you know, the, the complicated or obscure or difficult passage in light of the clear ones. So with that kind of sola scriptura, high view of scripture, in many ways, I feel like that served me in practicing the humility to let the Bible be messy, mm-hmm. right? And, yeah, yeah. And I, and I know, like you said, the, the human desires for connecting all the dots and everything fitting together really well. And I get that. It's satisfying. I want that. Um, and it's easy to sleep at night. You can explain your faith uh, more, I guess, reasonably to a culture that already thinks we're weird and off our rocker for believing <laughs> in a, a God, man. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I, I understand that sentiment, but you're right. It's uh you have to practice the humility of allowing the Bible to not close all the circles. Like I always repeat this from one of my professors. He was like, if there was a circle, Luther felt comfortable leaving a circle open where it should close. Whereas the Calvin felt the need to close the circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps it breaks down the personality. I'm not sure, but it took me time. You're right. Cause I had to, I had to open a circle back up. Yeah, and that's the hard part. It's like, no, I thought I already understood these texts. I thought I already dealt with these issues, you know. And um, even when I look at some of the responses to my project, extra notes, those are some of the exact spaces people are stumbling in. It's yeah. Well, how can there be, you know, the reality that God alone saves divine yeah. monogism, but then on the flip side, you say someone can walk away from their faith, and in their mind, that reflects poorly on God. Yeah. And I'm like, that's a self-imposed standard you've placed on God. God doesn't seem yeah. to really have prioritized explaining that, nor does mm-hmm. it seem like it's a it's not the kind of weakness that he's afraid of people being exposed to. In fact, it's not yeah. a weakness at all. It's just who he is and how he decided to work in terms of how he engages humanity. Yeah. And you really have to like submit under those truths and those realities and uh And my guess is this, my guess is a lot of people that are resisting right now, the more they sit with the project, revisit some of these scriptures that they felt like we already understand and, and, you know, sealed and and it's done. My guess is they're going to start to reconsider them 
from this juxtaposition. Because I think a lot of Calvinists have a, a, the strongest muscle in engaging the Armenian perspective. But in terms yeah. of engaging the Lutheran perspective, it's a different muscle. It's a, it's a weaker reflex in that regard. So I'm already seeing it. People hitting me up like, yo, this is interesting, bro. Like, I don't, I don't yeah. know if I have an answer for this. Or they'll give me their arguments against Arminianism. And I'm saying, I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I don't have with that. Well, what are you saying? Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> let's go over it again. You know what I'm saying? So I'm getting a lot of that too. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the Lutheran position is this awkward, it, it sort of doesn't get attention in the big debates. I mean, I remember a few years ago, there was, gosh, it might, it might have been six, seven years ago now, there was this big debate on Twitter, you know, not, it, it was, it was uh, being advertised on Twitter, you know, the great debate between the Reform and the Arminian, and it was just called the great debate. <laughs> but the, and uh, and the way it was talked about is this: those are the only two options out there. And I think for a lot of people, that is sort of the way it's seen. It's like this is this is all that is out there in Protestantism, you know. Yeah. Well, this is uh, that, that, and that's part. That's largely Lutheran's fault uh, as well. That's yeah, because Luther, Lutheran's refusing to engage and get involved in the debate or mm -hmm. add a third option. Yeah, can be a, a big contributor to that. But now, what I'm curious about, Flame, I just I'd love to hear sort of. Uh, well, first of all, how long were you actually in the Reformed? world or would you would you have called yourself reform yeah so it was it was 18 years 18 in, years yeah, in that. 18 okay. years in that and um yeah when, so when did you start to find yourself wrestling and struggling and and what led to the journey you're on now yeah it was interesting because um so i i went to concordia uh 2016 but i do remember like around 2015 um, it was certain like sermons that I would listen to and certain conversations I would have with people. Um, and, and we all started to feel like, like, man, like this is, uh, this is getting harder. I don't know if it's because as you, as you age, life gets a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, I won't say too much, but there's a guy that I was talking with and he was saying, you know, something happened in his family and um, one of his close family members had gotten cancer. And he remembers um, there was a sermon that talked about, you know, God is sovereign over every cancer cell and, and that God gave that cancer. And it was like this strange celebration of it, like almost like to God's glory, let's be, like not be okay with cancer, but let's kind of embrace it with almost this positive attitude it, it just started to get weird and seem like it moved from a healthy consideration of god being in control to like this mm -hmm. uh morbid thing mm -hmm. and so for us we just started having these discussions about and obviously i'm sure a lot of reformed persons would say that that's um unhealthy as well sure sure yeah. but the, the thing was on a pragmatic and personal level a lot of those things are constantly being said a lot of those things are regularly showing up in sermons. And, and as you're trying to deal with those kind of things or personal struggles, and you start to ask like, man, like it, to, 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 to portray the mind of God in that way mm -hmm. starts to get weird. Mm -hmm. And to fast forward a bit, it was helpful to hear Luther talk about stuff like a theologian of glory versus a theologian of the cross. Now I know he didn't later continue to use that language, but it was helpful to at least think about a theologian of glory, a person who uh, seems to peel back the mysteries of God's mind and to explain what he's up to. And when those kind of things start showing up in sermons, that it, and then you start to think, well, I guess God gave me cancer, wants me to have cancer, wants me to be happy with it. It just gets weird. And then it, it can make you upset with God in a way that's unhealthy and not intended. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it was a lot of those conversations mm. around 2014, 2015. It just kept coming up. And even as people come to me with their sin struggles and be like, yo, Flame, help me with this, help me with that. Matthew 7, I'm scared that I will prove to be one of the ones that was never with him in the first place. And it was just like, I didn't have a lot of real answers. I'm just like, I mean, just, you know, just repent, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and ask God for forgiveness. But I never had the answer that could say, honestly, bro, like that's not 
what the Lord was getting at with that Matthew 7. Right. So as mm -hmm. my mind started to really start to like question a lot of those constructs, sermon presentations, misuse of scripture, it just so happened that one of my close friends who was a student at a Baptist seminary in California was moving back to St. Louis and his professor at the Baptist seminary was like, yo, if you're going back to St. Louis and you're going to seminary, you need to check out Concordia Seminary. So he told me, hey, Flame, I know you're moving back to St. Louis and I know you're talking about going back to seminary as well. We mm -hmm. should check out Concordia. Mm -hmm. So I, for me, it was like a fluke. Like I didn't, it wasn't like a crisis per se. It was almost like I just went because my homie that I trust, uh, who's a history buff, loves church history, recommended it. And I wanted to go to the best school in that regard. So yeah, I went and on my, like, on a, it was so funny because, like, the first day I did, like, a walkthrough, the whole time I'm talking about the Reformation, Doctrines of Grace, John Calvinist, I appreciate John Calvin, and I would give Luther a little, you know, hat tip, but for the most part, I was celebrating <laughs> the Doctrines of Grace. I didn't even realize sure. that there was this, you know, that these major distinctions in, in, in important areas, like you said earlier, not that they aren't, you know, cool in many areas in many regards yeah. but there are, there are these differences that you have to consider so for me like i started to get exposed as i stayed on campus started reading the books and hearing the terminologies so it kind of caught me off surprise so to speak <laughs> was it was so, it yeah. a was there a moment when like you were hearing some stuff maybe i mean about lord's supper or baptism or something where you're like hold up did i make a mistake like am i in the wrong bro. am i in the wrong place <laughs> hey i literally bro i literally I was like, God, I was like, am I in a cult? I was like, Lord, please. <laughs> I, I was like, protect me if I'm, if I'm becoming a part of a cult, God. I was like, I'm so scared. And, um, but it, it was, it was just like these weird medieval baby, like in, uh, baptism saves infant baptism. <laughs> Christ is present in the bread and the wine. I'm just like, bro, this is, this is weird. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 remember, I, had, I remember the I remember the first time I like I I, I this is a re, this is true. Uh I was I was watching a a, prof, a Lutheran professor lecture and I was really considering Lutheranism stuff. And this dude says uh he's talking about the Lord's Supper and he was talking about John six and stuff. And and now I say this all the time. Uh yeah. but the first time I heard it, it it was crazy because he says <laughs> What I'm telling you is I know I have eternal life because I eat and drink God. And I was like, nope. And like, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and what I think it is, obviously there are like theological differences, but I think um, part of the implication of the, the reform thought, at least in the reform Baptist way that I came up under was there's this, sort of uh not like i don't want to say low view and be offensive but there's there isn't a beefy view of how god interacts with his creation to bring about grace you know mm -hmm. and um and when you think about creation and the way i understood reformed thought it's more about this godward obedience you're more mm -hmm. so thinking about your affections and your motivations yep. and you want to keep yep. your heart right Sure. So those are the higher things. Those are the pure things. And creation is just kind of like, you know, yeah, God created it, but it doesn't give you the gospel, right? Creation, and, and I would agree with that. Creation doesn't lead you to Christ, but we shouldn't demonize it or not see how God engages. Like Christ took on humanity himself. Uh, Old Testament, there are many, you know, uh, uh, washings that God will use or, sacrificial elements that are earthly that God uses mm -hmm. to apply some form of grace to his people. And as I started to reconsider Christology and how God has functioned in the Old Testament, I'm like, you know what? It's not that weird for God to use these earthly elements to bring about his salvific pur purposes. You know what I mean? And, and if, I, if I can follow the scriptures where they lead based on my good, healthy, solar scriptura principle, and I could also see through that, that God uses humanity and in the most strict way in the God man, the person of Christ mm -hmm. himself takes humanity up into the Godhead. Like that's, that's mind blowing, right? Yeah. So the more I start to really embrace that, I see 
I have to explore this at least and not be so reactionary, but at least yeah. explore it. And I think that's what the Lord started to use to really help warm my heart. It's an interesting thing when, you know, this language that we use, you know, a means of grace, means of grace, the means part of it, all of a sudden when, when that, it, uh, for me, it was like a, it, it was a snap. All of a sudden I started seeing it all over scripture. I started yeah. seeing, you know, God could have come to Moses in some other way, but he chooses to use a bush, you know, God <laughs> could have a cleansed name in the, le in the leper some other way, but he chose to use water. Like he's, he's using things. Yes. in order to bring about healing and salvation yeah. to people this this once i once that clicked then it was like oh oh i understand now i get how this works yeah and it doesn't rob god of any glory it doesn't no like you said it's just the word choosing how he wants to work it's just a means right mm -hmm. and um you know I well, well like, i mean well the means too man like the, the what you realize is that that god god knows what what's up because what he does is when he attaches grace to means then i don't have to i don't have to wonder where it is just floating out in the ether somewhere like i gotta have that that you know that worship song on and then if the sun hits goes through my windshield just right and hits me and i feel warm by him like i think god's up to something like i don't have to do that like i know yeah. where god's up to something and i know what that something is that he's up to right and like and so the means are not just because it's not because god can't do it another way but he knows that it's better if we are looking outside, like we're like, okay, I know that like that bread and wine and that water and word, like that, yeah. that's where I'm going to, that's where I'm going to get the forgiveness of sins and life and salvation <laughs> and the grace of God. So I don't, I don't have to go, like try to like, you know, um, approach God just one-on-one -on -one and be like, God, I just need some grace right now and have no idea if where I could get it or if I got it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, I mean, this does go to, I mean, the means of grace are uh, great means of grace are extra nos me like great like they're they're fountains of grace that are outside you they're they're objective you know yeah uh, i can i can doubt my affections for god all day long and and i got loads of days where i where i should if i, I mean if it's up to how much uh, how, how affectionate i'm feeling towards god like i'm in deep trouble what i can't deny is that i went up to that rail on sunday heard those words, this is the body of Christ broken for you, Daniel. This is the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins, Daniel. Like that's, that happened. Like, I can't deny it, right? This is right. an objective thing. So, yeah. and it happened no matter how I feel that day. I know that that's what happened. Yes. And, and it's so interesting too. Like, there was a few things that really helped me. I remember when, um, like, when Dr. Beerman was helping me understand that God is into basically hooking us up with a multiplicity of ways to find that comfort. Because we're as humans, we we doubt, and we so we go inside to look for something, and it's like I don't see the sincerity there. I don't see enough sadness or enough brokenness, and and yeah. I will doubt, and 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 I wouldn't be able to depend on that. And but to see that God is into giving this multiplicity of ways to comfort the conscience, you know what I mean? And then back to the to the to the phrase means that was really helpful for me because another thing that he said was um if the goal is to get water to someone and i do it i can do it through putting water in a bucket and taking water to the person i can build a irrigation system and water you know uh, the needed area or i could use a water hose it's not about the means per se it's it's just how god is delivering his yeah. grace you know, it's, it's just that, a vehicle it's really that simple it's just it's a just vehicle, a vehicle. And, Right. Same and, substance. And, well, by Christ. It's just these are the ways that God has said Christ has delivered to us. That's it. It's, it's by Christ. These are just the ways. And I think that took the spookiness out of it. That took yeah. the dark medieval witchcraft, cult, <laughs> cult practice, scary element away from it when yeah. you see it in the scriptures elsewhere and you realize it's just, it's just God, it's God understanding we are people, we're fearful, we doubt, and he wants to uh, comfort us and, and wrap his loving arms around us through means. You feel me? And I think that will really resonate with a hurt and broken generation of people that right now, everybody's already, not everybody, I say that loosely, but so many people are in touch with their depression or anxiety that's just in the culture. It's just kind of like the spirit of the day. 
And I think this message is so relevant because it's not a lot going on inside of just so many of the young people. And I'm saying, yo, like, it's not in there anyway. You were never going to find personal identity in there anyway. You were never going to find hope, love, and a reason to live in that space anyway. Come out from navel gazing, as they say, or looking down or looking within yourself and see what Christ has done. And in these many ways, he wants to put before you to give you that peace and that assurance. Yeah. And that's what got me excited. And that's why I love to just write about it. So I got a I lot more it, to come. Yeah, yeah, man. The the it, it seemed like, I think it was Ambrose that said uh and so I think that's reassuring when when you think like, oh man, this is uh, people will say I mean I'll go talk to people and stuff and they'll be like, Man, I just I love the I love this uh this new perspective you have. My like, man, this this is not new. This is old, <laughs> man. This is like old <laughs> like, I, like I'm not saying anything new, man. Like this, yeah, this, yeah. this is just like a remix of a very old song, you know. <laughs> so, right. The uh but what Ambrose I think it was Ambrose that said uh, the grace of God um is everywhere the way that the water is everywhere it's in the atmosphere right like he's like water's everywhere you just h2o everywhere man he's like mm. but uh if you need a drink you got to go to a well mm. like you can't you can't take so like so the idea is like yeah god's omnipresent and like i mean in common grace is a thing i mean the, the fact that our hearts are beating yeah. and, the, and we're breathing in and out like this is the grace of god to, to everyone and this is what yeah. god says like hey it rains on the just and the unjust man like i, I mean that's god is gracious to be yeah. sure uh, yeah. But if you want to go drink deeply of that grace, there's there's places he's promised to dispense that in a different way. So yeah. so so the grace of God is present uh, yeah. all, everywhere, but it's not present in the same way everywhere. Like like there's yeah. there's something else going on uh, in the yeah. Lord's supper. There's something else going on in baptism. He says I'm I'm promising to be present, doing a certain thing in yeah. these things, uh, using yeah. these vehicles, and that's and that's comforting uh that i don't have to go search for that because i mean because you know, people will say like if you're just talking about grace of god in the abstract man like you don't, i don't there's there's days where i don't i don't I, I feel like i need some grace but i don't know yeah. you don't know where to get it right yeah, uh, yeah. and then you I start doing that. crazy things like uh you know uh you, you'll you'll be like well what i'll do is i'll dig in these scriptures or i'll get on my knees and i'll pray and and then you start you're trying to use those as a way to to earn some grace which is Something that by de definition of grace cannot be done, right? Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it is it is that cycle, and it sends you in that that downward spiral eventually. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and, and I think it's so interesting too because like even when I read my direct messages or some of my responses, which has literally been like ninety nine percent positive, but I think the people that are gridlocked, one of their main concerns is, um. So you say you can do whatever you want to do. You can live however you want to live. And mm -hmm. I'm like, no, that's not, that's not the point. The point is, I, I feel like what Luther helped do was help us rediscover, and, and the Lutheran tradition in many ways, rediscover uh, Paul in, the, in a human way. Like, it's like the mm -hmm. Bible really understands the complexity of this human experience, how hard it is how weird it is, how up and down it is, the ebb and flow of emotions, mood, uh, how good you're doing versus how you might be at a low point. And, and Lutheran writings seem to really get that, like the complexity mm -hmm. and how heavy, right? You may be in a good season at one point and at a, at a, at a, a low season at another point. And so it isn't that we're saying do whatever you want. That's yeah. not what we're saying. Um, the thing is that God understands along this journey the complexities and he's into meeting you at every point. So when I need to, to kind of snap out of it, he has a word for me. When I need um, to not be so discouraged, he has a word for me. His law and his gospel speak to me as I find myself at any point in his human experience. Yeah. Um, and I can hear right now, you know, my Reformed Baptist friends say, we we talk like that too. We we don't say sure. that um, you look to your sanctification for your justification. And I acknowledge that so many times on a project. You're right. I acknowledge that. That's how I was able to stay sane in a Reformed Baptist circle is because so many good pastors and friends pointed me towards sola fide and grace alone. All I'm saying is the thing I think is so far, one of the most helpful things about the Lutheran construct is it's the preoccupation with some of the examine yourself 
uh, mm -hmm. check your fruit, Matthew 7, that you might be surprised that you were never re really with God in the first place. Mm -hmm. There's a preoccupation with some of those texts and they get misapplied and applied too regularly mm -hmm. so that though you may affirm sola fide, the preoccupation with examining yourself, on it makes it unhealthy. And it's an unfortunate consequence of other things that you said. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I'm not saying you don't promote sola fide. Amen. Yes, you do. Yeah. But there are other things that flow out of some of these other doctrines that start to chisel away at your well-established sola fide. And for me, it was things like, like um, you know, limited atonement and, uh, and, and things like that that would gridlock me at a low point. I'm like, man, am I in? Sure. It, yeah. Well, I experienced Matthew 7, and I didn't have, I had to obviously default to what we say, felicitous inconsistency. I default to right thinking because that's what true hope is. And mm -hmm. a lot of times mm -hmm. we don't talk as good as we think, or we don't articulate things as best as we experience them. And um, so that's what, that's what I always help people understand as I continue to build out and talk about this transition in myself. It's uh it's, I just think this is a fuller picture of the gospel, a fuller understanding of the complexity of the human experience and God giving us his two words when needed yeah. to keep us on par. And he will preserve his elect. We all agree with that. Mm -hmm. It's just that the things that you quickly jump to when you try to close that circle that we have to kind of slow down and think about. Well, yeah. you know, the, you mentioned law and gospel and, and, you know, really what it comes down to Pre preaching long gospel, teaching long gospel, learning to think in those terms, it's just, it's such a pastoral way of directly dealing with the individual that's before you at any given moment. There, we may need, oh, there's times where we need the word of the law, and there's times where we need the word of the gospel. As a matter of fact, we need them all the time. We need them all the time. <laughs> but sometimes yeah. those words can be very specifically applied to very specific situations. And so it, it functionally becomes a very pastoral way of addressing the sinner that's sitting before you. That's, Love that's, I mean, that's certainly what I found in my ministry career that, uh, and, and again, I, I know plenty of people on the reform side of, uh, of the aisle here that, that are, they affirm law and gospel. They're very much, uh, influenced by, you know, that way of, of preaching and that way of, uh, interpretation. And so, I don't want to discount that, but it, I just want to affirm that that is one of the, I mean, because it's so, so, so central to, I think, Lutheran thought, uh, it's, it is a big benefit to the way that we think about how we engage with our world and how we engage with ourselves. Yeah. 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 It's how you, it's, it's also, what you were talking about sort of this, uh, this can happen in, you know, any tradition, this happens in the revivalist traditions too, it's sort of this obsession with the false convert. Um, mm. and, and Lutheranism, like, just doesn't really do, like, have this as an obsession to the degree that a lot of other traditions do, because, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, we would, we would say, like, well, what a false convert needs is the same thing that the non-convert <laughs> needs, and the same thing that the convert needs, which is law and gospel. So, so we don't yeah. have, like, a different message <laughs> for, for, like, like, believer, unbeliever, I'm like, yo, I still got that old Adam, so I'm still gonna need to hear law and gospel, uh, which yeah. is the very same thing that the false convert and the and the dude who doesn't want, think he's saved or want to be saved. We all need to hear the same thing, right? Like, so mm -hmm. we're like, yo, I need, I still need to like be crushed by the law, be devastated, and be raised to life by the gospel, just like everybody else. And yeah. so we're sort of like, hey, man, we got, we got, we're kind of like one trick pony when it comes to the, this sort of thing. We're like, we're gonna give people law and gospel because it's the only thing yeah. that's gonna get it done anyway. And God's the one that's gonna use, you know, the Spirit's gonna use these things to to kill and then to to bring to life. And so, uh, and I think that also there, it does seem that, uh, it does seem that some people like you look at the parable of like the, the wheat and the tares, like, you know, like the master plants all this wheat then like the enemy comes in, sows these tares. And then like the workers, like, which is like us, they're like, yo, what, what happened? Did you plant bad seed in the field or what? And, uh, and the master's like, no, nah, man, an enemy did this. Uh, and they're like, yo, you want us to go get like separate it? You want us to go gather it up? You want to go chop it down? Like purify the field a little bit? He's like, nah, you guys cannot be trusted with this job. <laughs> and so, and so, and so, like, it's like, I don't know what you, like, what you could do with that parable other than say like, look, dude, whatever you do, 
Like yeah. it is not, it is not in your, in, uh, in your job description, no matter who you are as a Christian to go figure out who is in and who is out. Like our job yeah. is to go preach Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. Right. And so, yeah. uh, and the reason that it's funny, but you know, the reason Jesus gives that, yo, you shouldn't, you shouldn't engage in uh, wheat and tear separating is because he says, you will inevitably throw out some wheat. Like you will inevitably uproot some wheat because like some of that wheat is rough looking at times. And you'll be like, well, that, <laughs> you know, and like, and, and that, and he doesn't say, Oh, don't separate it because you might let some of that tear, some of the tear stay in. Yeah. Like it's the other, it's the other direction. He's like, no, no, no. You're definitely going to throw away some, some stuff that I planted uh, yeah. because you, you, you don't like the way it looks. Right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. So you like, take examples like that and you're like, are there, is a false convert like a thing? Yeah, I'm not saying it's not a thing. What I'm saying yeah. is law and gospel is what that person needs, is what I need, is what you need. It's what, it's yeah. what everyone needs, man. Um, yeah, I love that, bro. So I love that. Yeah. <laughs> well, right on. Well, guys, uh, we're we're coming up on an hour here, so we won't take up a ton of time. Okay. Uh, we could I could do this all day, man. I like, know. Uh, yeah, this has been a blast, Flame. This has been really fun, man. Yeah, man, so likewise, likewise, man. And you know what? I want to say really quickly, I do remember um Dr. Aaron talking about the context of, you know, at least historically, Lutherans being more introverted in terms of just kind of preserving some of the traditions and the culture as they migrated to the states and in the Midwest. And, um, and, and that's to be appreciated too. Like I can, I can appreciate that component, but I do like this wave. Like the, the fact that you guys reached out to me and you're already doing cool things and, and that I can put it to music. It seemed like it's a good time to, Mm -hmm. Just continue to export Lutheran and Lutheran Luther's ideas. Um, a lot of people are ripe and ready for this presentation of the gospel. So I think it's a good time. And not to say major efforts haven't happened in Lutheranism. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying I like what's going on now. Yeah. I like hearing, you know, some of the ecumenical discussion and uh, and us talking about these things. That's the thing I felt I was at a disservice was nobody was nobody brought it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why didn't nobody tell me about Lutheranism? Why wasn't it a part of the discussion? I'm just <laughs> excited that now I feel like I can play my part in making it a part of the discussion. We have to talk yeah. about this. It's yeah. so good. Yeah, you know Abso so. absolutely. Amen, man. man. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That's so good. So, any, anybody yeah. who's watching or listening, uh, definitely go check out Flames uh, EP, Extra Nose. Uh, so good. Even, so if, good, even if you've like, never listened to like a rap song in your whole life, other than like, <laughs> like maybe you even went and got, like you were watching the Oscars and like Eminem popped up on there and like you took a bathroom yeah. break. Like even if you're that guy, <laughs> like you should, you should check out Flames EP. Uh, it's so, good. so no, good. I'm Love. Yeah, I'm not flattering, man. It really nah, is man. so good. Man, I appreciate yeah. that. It means yeah. a lot. Thank you guys. Yeah. Seriously. So,